for those who've just joined, we're going to give a couple minutes um, to let people um, trickle in through and we'll start at about 9.05. All right, everyone, we're ready to start. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cece Chen, um, and I'm the director of the Single Cell Profiling Center um, at Caltech. And my co-host is Teresa Loveless, um, who is finishing her postdoc uh, at UC Irvine and will be starting her own lab um, next summer at Rice, working on synthetic biology and single cell lineage tracing. So we're very excited about that. Um, we're both very excited today to host today's session of the Leading Edge Symposium, which is focused on, on genomics and developmental biology. And today we have uh, such a fantastic slate of talks for you from fellows who are applying cutting edge genomics technology um, towards all sorts of questions um, from organ development and stem cell fate choice, to how organisms regulate their body temperature um, and tissue regeneration. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, Rachel Shahan. <laughs> 
Rachel Shahan is a postdoctoral fellow at, UC, at, at, sorry, at Duke University, who is really interested in the fundamental processes underlying plant organ development. She earned her PhD at the University of, of Maryland, um, studying the molecular regeneration of strawberry fruit, um, sorry, the molecular regulation of strawberry fruit development. Um, at Duke, she has led a collaborative effort to generate and utilize a transcriptomic atlas of the Arapidopsis root at single cell resolution, which is a really exciting story she's gonna be telling us more about today. All right, um, take it away, Rachel. Thank you so much, CC. Can you see everything? Screen looks good? Looks great. Okay, so it's really a pleasure to be part of the Leading Edge community, and I'm very excited to share um, a summary of my work with you today. So before we jump into the details, I'll just give you a little bit more background about myself. So I'm a plant developmental biologist, as CC mentioned, um, and my interest in plants really began very early um, as a kid working on farms. So at some point I became very interested in how does a plant grow up and then form new organs in the form of flowers? And how do those flowers change their form and develop into fruit? So to study this, I went to grad school. I went to the University of Maryland and joined the lab of Zhang Chi Lu in order uh, to identify transcriptional regulation, transcriptional regulators for fruit development using a diploid strawberry as a model. My project was really about developing the infrastructure for this developing model. So in particular, strawberry is a, a great model for this. I'll just mention because the seeds are actually on the outside of, of the fruit instead of on the inside. So this is really much easier to study tissue um, to tissue communication. But towards the end of my PhD, I realized some of the questions I was really most interested in were how do stem cell progeny acquire their identity and differentiate? This is really hard to study in flowers and in strawberry where it's really difficult uh, to do lineage tracing. So for my postdoc, I joined the lab of Philip Benfi at Duke in order to use the root of the model plant Arabidopsis as a model. And the reason being, of course, um, that it's much easier to trace cell lineages and there are a lot of molecular tools available. So as a quick primer to the root, here's a confocal image. Um, there's a stem cell niche here at the root tip. And since root cells uh, don't move relative to each other as the root grows, the longitudinal axis is essentially a developmental timeline with the youngest cells here closest to this stem cell niche at the tip. And you can easily and visually chase up, trace upwards and the cells will mature as you approach the shoot. So for me, the question is a postdoc and moving on, the, what I'm most interested in is what controls cell identity specification and differentiation? And most specifically, I'm interested in this on a transcriptional level. So what gene regulatory networks control spatiotemporal gene expression? So when I first joined my postdoc lab a few years ago, this is really when single cell RNA sequencing was first uh, coming on the scene. So I thought this was a fantastic opportunity for my interest to really look at how differentiation, how de developmental trajectories change over time in much higher resolution. So for example, in the roots here, previously with bulk uh, tissue methods, you had to conflate either um, developmental zones or developmental stages or cell types. So if you were interested, for example, in the youngest cells of the root, you had to conflate multiple cell types. Or if you wanted to uh, look at a particular cell type, like the one shown here in blue, you could isolate it with facts, but then you would conflate multiple developmental stages. So for the last couple of years, I've been leading a very collaborative effort in order to create a single cell transcriptomic atlas of the Arabidopsis root. And this work I'm describing was recently published in Developmental Cell. So we use the 10X genomics platform uh, in order to profile around 110,000 cells. We integrated them all together. Um, and so that's represented here in a UMAP plot, uh, which is shown here in 3D. So on the UMAP, each dot represents an individual cell. And the cells here are colored according to the cell type annotation that we've assigned to them. So it's really satisfying, just nice to be able to look at this visualization of all of the data and see that each cell type is represented here nicely in, in different branch um, coming off of a central point at the bottom of the UMAP. In addition to different cell types, we are able to annotate different developmental stages, morphological stages that are easy to see along the longitudinal axis of the root. So I mentioned that just briefly a minute ago, but to show you the meristematic zone, which I'll talk about, is closest to the tip, which is where cells divide. 
cells then elongate, they get much bigger in the elongation zone. And then in the maturation or differentiation zone, they acquire cell type specific morph morphological characteristics. So here's the UMAP plot again, same one you just saw, just compressed into 2D. And now it's colored according to the cell type, or uh, excuse me, to developmental stage. So the youngest cells here are at the base of the UMAP where all the branches connect to each other. And for each cell type specific branch, you can see the cells gradually mature and the most mature cells are here at the tips of each of the branches. So with this data, the first one of the first questions we asked or interested in this for a tool is, are there genes, are there markers that are expressed in specific cell types, but also in specific developmental stages? And to cut to the chase, the short answer to that is no, there is not. It doesn't seem like there are markers like that for most cell types, suggesting to us that each cell type, the transcriptional changes underlying its maturation are much gradual, much more gradual. So to investigate those gradual changes, we applied pseudotime estimation in order to order the cells from youngest to oldest based on their transcriptional profiles. So we did this for all of the different tissue types in the atlas. I'm just showing you here one example, which is what we call the ground tissue. So I separated those cells out from the atlas and re-embedded them here in their own new map plot. So there are two cell types here, endodermis um, in dark blue, one half the ground tissue, and the other half uh, is cortex shown in light blue. So for developmental stage annotation, the youngest cells on the left, the three stages, we can see the most, the oldest cells are here on the right, the tips of the branches. But the pseudotime estimation, we can really break down that developmental progression and look at it in finer resolution. So again, the youngest cells here are the red ones on the left. They progress to the oldest cells here uh, in the 10th um, pseudotime bin in purple on the right. So with these pseudotime bins separating this trajectory from more finely like this, we're able to identify uh, waves of gene expression changes that occur over time. So this is particularly interesting to me because I'm interested in identifying the transcription factors that are driving these changes uh, for cell types, for the different cell types, which pushing them towards a specific cell fate. So to address that question, we collaborated with the lab of Jeff Schiebinger at the University of British Columbia to apply an optimal transport-based lineage reconstruction uh, to our atlas. So just in a nutshell, really, the optimal transport allows us to identify a cell or a group of cells and trace forwards or backwards in time in order to identify ancestors and trace all the way uh, through each cell to the descendants. So with this approach, we're able uh, also to calculate a cell fate probability for every cell in the atlas. So for the 14 different cell types we know are in the root, we're able to calculate each for each cell, what's the probability that they will become one of those cell types. So here, this is the UMAP just colored according to the probability that each cell will acquire endodermis fate. So this is useful because we can use these probabilities and apply regression along with the gene expression data to try to identify genes or particularly transcription factors that really uh, push cells towards a specific fate. So I don't have time to talk about that, but that's something that I'm actively following up on, on in the lab now with some of our most interesting candidates. So to change gears here towards the second part of the talk, in addition to developing the Atlas to uh, study wild type root development, I was also interested in using the Atlas, developing this as a resource to inform new data sets, and in particular, smaller data sets um, and data sets that are derived from developmental mutants. So the tools to do this already exist from Rahul Satija's lab in the um, Surat pipeline. So essentially, you can take the annotations from the atlas, that cell type shown here, developmental stage, pseudotime, and transfer them over um, to data sets generated from, from developmental mutants in my case. So as a proof of principle, the first thing that I wanted to do, of course, was to try this on two mutants that we already know a lot about. So I profiled the mutants of two transcription factors, short root and scarecrow, which have been studied in my postdoc lab, the Benfi lab, for a very long time. And both of those transcription factors are really crucial for ground tissue development. So to show you here in the wild type, the ground tissue, again, consists of endodermis in blue, cortex here shown in yellow, um, and those two cell types are formed from asymmetric divisions of the same stem cell daughter shown here in orange. However, in the short root mutant, there's no asymmetric division so that the ground tissue is instead one mutant layer with cortex identity. And in scarecrow, that asymmetric division is also lost. There's still only the single mutant layer, but it has a mixed identity of both, corte of both cortex and endodermis. So to cut straight to the point, I profiled both a single cell RNA-seq Combine the data uh, with wild type control. And here you're, you can see all three 
three genotypes, just in the same UMAP orientation, so it's easier to compare. So the gist of this is that we were able to see uh, cell identity and tissue composition phenotypes that we expected in the ground tissue in the dark and light blue here compared to wild type and also others. Um, so this gives me a lot of confidence in the annotation of the atlas and its utility as a resource. However, I they think, or I recognize, I was interested in this also as an opportunity, not just for proof of principle, but also to investigate a, a question that's been outstanding, even though one of the mutants, Scarecrow, is, has really been studied uh, for 30 years. So that question is, what's the nature of this mixed identity phenotype of the mutant layer? So there are three possibilities that I could think of. One is that each cell actually has a mixed identity, which is what is shown in this graphic or the mutant layer is a heterogeneous mixture of some sort of two different cell types. Um, and related to that, it's possible that cells could perhaps change their identity over time. So again, just to cut straight to the punchline here, uh, the data, we looked at this in a number of ways, but the data really supports that the third possibility here and that's that cells change their identity over time. So here, just to show you the pseudotime annotation, I pulled out the mutant layer cells from Scarecrow and put them in, again in their own UMAP plot here. So the cortex cells in light blue are kind of grouped mostly together on the left, and then endodermis cells in dark blue are most prevalent on the right. And with the annotation of both developmental stage uh, and pseudotime here, the youngest cells are on the left-hand side and progress gradually. They mature towards the right-hand side, suggesting that cells begin with a cortex identity and acquire an endodermal identity as they age. So I looked at this also, of course, in vivo. I was interested um, if known markers support uh, this conclusion from the single cell data. So first, there's a published marker, which call is called CO2. This is expressed in the youngest scarecrow mutant layer, or expressed in, I'm sorry, in the youngest cells in wild type, but also in scarecrow. So here, this marker is shown in yellow in wild type, and it's expressed in the cortex cells closest uh, to the bottom, to the stem cell niche. And that's very similar uh, in, in scarecrow, suggesting that the youngest cells do indeed have cortex identity. I also crossed in some additional markers. So for the first one over here on the left, this is a marker in wild type um, shown here in green that's expressed in more mature cortex cells. However, in scarecrow, this marker is strongly diminished. So suggesting that mature cortex identity is lost or diminished um, in the scarecrow mutant. I also looked at expression of a marker that's um, uh, an endodermal marker, which is normally expressed in the wild type on the left-hand side um, at the tip of the root in the youngest cells, and then all the way up um, in this frame towards the, the older cells here at the top of the root. However, in scarecrow, the expression of this marker is delayed. So it's a little bit hard to see here, but the GFP expression is in between these two blue arrows and the tip of the root is here at the bottom, suggesting that an endodermal identity comes on again in older scarecrow cells, scarecrow mutant layer cells. So the conclusion from this is there's evidence for a cell identity transition in the scarecrow mutant. And this is interesting to me, I think, as an opportunity to really study cell identity, cell fate, plasticity. So with, with this transcriptional data. So some questions I, that are interesting to me to, um, to investigate further are, how do cells forget their previous identity? And is there an unstable transitional state, for example, that's required for an identity transition? This data also is interesting for our lab, since we've been looking at Scarecrow for a very long time, um, in that it suggests something new, that Scarecrow is actually required for early endodermis identity. So there must be another uh, factor at play that's acting at later developmental stages to induce endodermal identity. Uh, and finally, the atlas, the annotations, and our data processing, everything that I've learned, I hope are really useful resources for the community, and also for me, of course, moving forward with my own work. So to wrap up here, the, in the last little section of the talk, I just want to talk about uh, the future. So I'm on the job, I plan to be on the job market this year, and my vision for the future Shahan Lab is that we will investigate transcriptional regulation of cell identity and cell state transitions underlying post-embryonic organogenesis, still using the Arabidopsis root as a model, and we will do this with a combination of molecular genetics, functional genomics, including, but not limited to, of course, single cell RNA-seq, and live imaging. So in particular, I'm interested in using one cell type or starting out by using one cell type uh, as a model. And that cell type is the pericycle, which is shown here uh, in purple at the tip of the root. So the pericycle, I, I think, is very beautiful. It's so interesting. It's because it uh, is the only cell type in the Arabidopsis root that's capable of producing new 
post-embryonic organs. And those new organs are lateral roots. So in this video, you can see seedlings developing. The lateral roots are extending here at the top. And then if you watch over time, new lateral roots will form and extend uh, further and further down the root. So I think this is particularly uh, interesting um, because from the perspective of the pericycle, because even though lateral root development um, and lateral root cell fate identity have been studied, there's still a lot of questions in the pericycle itself. So in particular, do pericycle cells remain undifferentiated? So where lateral roots are forming, these are mature parts of the root, or do they actually mature and then de-differentiate to form lateral roots? And how is this controlled? Additionally, I think the pericycle is interesting not only for these fundamental developmental questions, but there are also some exciting translational applications for this line of research. So the lateral roots formed by the pericycle really determine root system architecture, which is different between different plants and also in different environments, which you can start to appreciate from this image. So if we can understand how the pericycle responds to different environmental signals, that might help us begin to engineer plants uh, that are better able, for example, to tolerate changing climates. So in conclusion, just to summarize everything that I just, just said, in the future, Shahan Lab will use the Arabidopsis root pericycle as a model. We'll have a three-pronged approach. We'll investigate what specifies pericycle identity. Why is it uniquely competent to form these new lateral roots, new post-embryonic organs? Do pericycle cells mature and de-differentiate? If so, how do they do that? How is that regulated transcriptionally? Or if not, how is, how is a stem cell identity maintained even though it's surrounded in older parts of the root by differentiated cells? And lastly, how does the pericycle perceive environmental signals that affect final root system architecture? So with that, I would like to acknowledge everyone involved in this work, my advisor, Philip Benfi, two postdocs who I worked very closely with in the Benfi lab, Trevor Nolan and Isaiah Taylor, our collaborator, Ben Cole, who's at the Joint Genome Institute, Uwe Oler's lab in Berlin, particularly Cho Wei Xu, who's a co-first author on this work, and the lab of Jeff Schiebinger at the University of British Columbia. I really appreciate the leading edge. It's a fantastic community, and I acknowledge funding from the NIH and also from HHMI. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. Um, while we wait for uh, questions to come in, I have a question to start with. Um, in your mutant um, um, plots, you had shown that the endodermis and cortex cells were changing, but there, I noticed that there were also these cells in orange and brown that look different between um, the different uh, mutants. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about that cell those cell types. Yeah, yeah, so this is actually really, <laughs> very serendipitous, very interesting for me and my interest in pericycle because the, the short root mutant actually is the one that does seem, it, it seems to lose actually pericycle identity, which I think is very exciting. There's a, some opportunities there to study how, how does short root regulate pericycle identity? What is downstream of short root um, that is controlling this identity acquisition? So in our lab, actually, uh, we have an inducible short root system. So I, I can imagine this would be really interesting to induce short root and then ask what, uh, what genes change uh, downstream that could be involved in pericycle cell identity acquisition. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so there's also a question in the chat from Julie. Um, she says, great talk, Rachel. Um, Julie Siegenthaler, University of Colorado. Um, have you thought about applying spatial transcriptomics? It seems like the route would be perfect to get a sense of the niche cell cell signaling. Yeah, I think that there are, there are some potentially really exciting opportunities there and something even that I would be really interested in is looking at the stem cells and the very youngest cells. I think that would be an exciting opportunity spatially to try to pull those out um, to, to identify how are they different from each other and, and how do those very early, um, like for example, the asymmetric division between cortex and endodermis very early on, what are the genes that differentiate those two? Because they do have different transcriptional profiles even very early. So I think for, for right now, um, spatial transcriptomics is still evolving. You know, it, the spots get smaller and smaller, so it gets it's easier and easier potentially to look at the roots since the cells are very small. We would need very high resolution for that. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but that's definitely evolving in plants and something that would be exciting for the future. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Thank you so much, Rachel. In the interest of time, I think we'll move on to the next speaker and Teresa will introduce her. Okay, Anusha, if you're sharing your screen, I will introduce you. 
uh, as you do that. Um, perfect. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited to introduce Anusha Shankar, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University. Uh, Dr. Shankar really integrates ecology, physiology, and transcriptomics to understand how animals adapt and respond to challenging environmental conditions. And she has this uh, really fantastic uh, organism that she's going to talk about today uh, in which she's studying uh, a particular response of uh, how do animals respond to changes in temperature. Uh, so please take it away. Thank you, Teresa. That pronunciation is always so on point. Thank you. Um, I am so excited to be here and uh, thank you all for being here as well. I would like to tell you a little bit about endotherms that can get cold and rewarm themselves and still manage to exist. Um, so I consider myself a physiological ecologist by training and I'm trying to become a slightly broader integrative biologist by integrating some genomics and transcriptomics kind of uh, ap approaches in my work. And what I'm really interested in knowing is what animals, uh, sorry, what mechanisms animals use to cope with variable environments. So uh, I'll start with an example. I study hummingbirds and I've been studying them for about 10 years. And I use this potato chip analogy to tell you just how high their metabolic rates are. So they're really small, we know that. They fly really fast, we also know that. Uh, what you may not know is that they barely store any fat, and so they really don't have a backup source of energy in case they run out of fuel. And so they have to they consume energy really fast, and they have to eat it really fast. So uh, if an average human who was like Matt Damon sized had just potato chips all day to meet their caloric needs, they would need to eat about 15 packets of potato chips a day. We'll just ignore that like vitamins and micronutrients exist. If they had the metabolic rate of an elephant, they would need to eat about four packets of potato chips a day. And if they had the metabolic rate of a hummingbird, they would need to eat about 600 packets of potato chips a day. So the larger you get, the less energy you need per unit mass and vice versa. So hummingbirds need a lot. Um, and what I really wanted to know in the field was given these energetic limitations, how variable is their daily energy expenditure? So we use this technique, which I think is ingenious, called the doubly labeled water method, where you feed the animal or you inject it in the, in the muscle with a double isotope of water. And then you let it mix with its body water for a bit, and then you collect a pea sample or a blood sample, and then you let the bird go. And 24 hours later from the field, you try to recatch it. And uh, in that time, it's been breathing out carbon dioxide and peeing out water. So it's losing oxygen two ways, and it's losing uh, the deuterium only one way. And so the difference tells you how much carbon dioxide they've been breathing out in 24 hours. And that's a really good proxy for how much energy they've spent in those 24 hours. So we can use this method with hummingbird pee, which excites me so much to know how much energy a bird spends in the field in 24 hours. So uh, another method we use uh, to break that down and to look at individual activities and how much energy they cost is to use this system called the respirometry system, which measures the oxygen and carbon dioxide in a bird's breath. So this bird is hovering out in the field, we don't even have to catch it, and we can measure how much energy it takes to hover. So uh, some of the, this is one of my field sites, it's in uh, Arizona, it's called Harshaw Creek, and it's vegetationally diverse, elevationally diverse, has some shade for students and hummingbirds to take some rest from the heat. And this is another site close by called Sonoita Creek, which is much more flat, hot, dry, less vegetationally and elevationally, and elevationally diverse. So we studied how much daily energy expenditure varies between these two sites. We thought it would be a lot. So this plot has daily energy expenditure on the y-axis, Harshaw Creek, which is the shady one on the left, and Sonoita on the right, and in different monsoon statuses uh, on the x-axis. So each plot here is uh, an individual bird and the colored points are a single individual that we recaptured in different seasons. So you can see some of them maintain their daily energy expenditure um, over here, and then some of them increased it sometimes hugely. And what was really striking to me when I first saw this plot is that Sonoida Creek in the early monsoon uh, almost doesn't, just doesn't actually overlap with Sonoida Creek in the pre-monsoon in terms of its daily energy requirements for the birds. So um, birds were hugely increasing the amount of energy they were spending in Sonoida Creek in the early monsoon. So what was this because of? Um, so we modeled this with different activity budgets. So the traditional activity budget is 
15% of the day spent hovering, 15% of the day spent flying, and uh, I can't see this part of my screen, but I should know this by heart, 70% of the day spent perching. So um, we model some lower activity scenarios and some higher activity scenarios because hummingbirds are too small to put like Fitbits on them. But we were able to model how much energy they need, they how, how much energy they used for different activities. And the only situation that could explain Sonoita Creek in the early monsoon was this super high activity scenario where they were spending 80% of their day active and 20% perching. So I've done some time budgets on myself and I spend a maximum, an absolute maximum of two hours a day, like dancing and doing exercise um, on average. And hummingbirds are spending like between three and 13 hours a day on high powered activity. And hovering is like 10 times more expensive, literally than sitting still. So that they can really change how much energy they use and how they spend their time based on um, something. We wanted to know what that something was. So we went out to the field and we assessed a bunch of parameters. It wasn't outside air temperatures, which we thought it might be. It was really the flowers. So in the Harshaw Creek and in the Sonoita, in the, both the sites in the early monsoon, the flower abundance was really high and the flower density was really high. And so the birds seemed to have been able to just sit in one place and feed. Whereas in the post monsoon and in Sonoita, the flowers were much more sparse and dispersed. So um, it took a lot more energy and time for the hummingbirds to get between flowers. And so they were able to go from three hours to 13 hours of activity uh, just to match that environmental need. So um, I'm trying to move further to more mechanistic questions from this whole animal energetic perspective and this ability for animals to vary their energetic needs to a more organ level metabolic trait kind of scale and to look at the underlying genetic mechanisms that allow for physiological flexibility. And so this is a, a, another component of my, my research plan over the last many years um, to study heterothermy because uh, hummingbirds are heterotherms. They can move between being ectotherms like lizards and snakes, allowing the outside air to decide their body temperature and being endotherms like us, uh, generating their own body heat, maintaining a high body temperature. And this is a really interesting strategy to deal with environmental variability. So how do these heterothermic animals exist is what I'm really obsessed in, with thinking about now. So hummingbirds that, uh, during the day, they're feeding on all those flowers, but at night they don't have that buffer of fat. It's dark, they can't find their food. So what they do instead is go into torpor. And torpor is, um, you, must have, you, you must know about hibernation, um, which is like a multi-day, multi-week torpor and hummingbirds use a daily version, daily torpor. So this is what torpor looks like. This is a hummingbird that I measured a few years ago with a thermal uh, infrared video kind of camera. And this is the eye region, this is the bill, and this is the tail. So um, hopefully you can see it now. It's, it's breathing, its heart is probably beating pretty fast, and it's maintaining a high body temperature. Um, this is a tiny three gram hummingbird that's like two dimes stacked together in weight. And on the right, this is a video, I promise. It's the same bird later the same night and you can barely see it. You have to kind of squint to figure out where the outline is because its whole body is the same temperature as the outside air, it's become an ectotherm. Um, and so they're functioning here at like 10% of their normal metabolism very often. So just to really highlight this contrast, a human, an average human maintains 98 degrees Fahrenheit most of the time. And if they even drop by two or two Celsius or, or three degrees Fahrenheit, they're considered in trouble. They're considered hypothermic and they have to be externally rewarmed or they'll be in trouble. A hummingbird is maintaining a normal high body temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit. But in torpor, the coldest a hummingbird has been recorded to get is three degrees Celsius. And so that's a difference of 38 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a huge difference. And they're saving um, so much of their energy and only spending about two to three, 30% of their energy compared to normal sleep when they're in this state. They're also complete, sorry, they're also completely useless because they can't respond to outside stimuli for like 20 or 30 minutes until they warm back up out of torpor. So um, I was really interested in knowing what genetic mechanisms allow an animal to exist at, and allow an endotherm to exist at 2% of its normal metabolic rate um, and then rewarm the next day and go about its day as if nothing has happened. 
So uh, we, we've been studying this the past two summers. I was just collecting this data until like three hours ago last night um, in Oregon. But we, we have this chamber that has a respirometry setup uh, and the thermal imaging setup that I talked about earlier. And we get these images of the hummingbirds at night. Um, and when we know that they're in one of these three metabolic states that are either asleep in transition to torpor or in deep torpor, we euthanize them, sadly, and collect tissues to look at um, tissue-specific gene expression in these metabolic states. So we have all of these tissues, the heart, lung, liver, brain, um, different regions of the brain, the pectoral muscle, and so on, and the gut. So um, we have all of these data on each bird. And uh, one interesting thing we noticed was that when we euthanized birds when they were asleep at a high body temperature, um, the heart would stop beating, but in torpor, the heart would keep beating for like 10 minutes. And so I think there's something about hypoxia tolerance and cold tolerance that's so interesting in these animals. The heart is beating really slowly, but it beats for a really long time, even um, once the bird is dead. So, um, and then again, if, if we'd let them live, they would have warmed back up and they wouldn't have had heart problems or muscle problems or, or anything. They live longer than you'd expect for their lifespan actually. Uh, so for, the, for their size. So um, some of our early results uh, have been coming out in the last two months. And we found that a lot of the genes that are upregulated in deep topper relative to normal thermi, I had this naive expectation that there'd be like none. I thought everything would be just depressed in, in deep topper, but it turns out that some things are upregulated and a lot of those are related to circadian rhythms. So it's somehow really important to keep track of time when you're almost dead. Um, and that's like one of the most important important things, which is, which is interesting. Um, a lot of the, this is um, the normalized gene counts of the gene called clock across these three different metabolic states of normal thermi transition and deep topper. And in almost every tissue, it's upregulated in deep topper, except in the, in the uh, distal gut. The same is true of another uh, group of clock, clock genes called the cry genes, cry one and cry two are all upregulated in every tissue type. And so uh, we're seeing these patterns for a bunch of different clock genes. And now I'm gonna be looking at the metabolic genes and the fat storage genes and um, some other key genes that I think will be really interesting. Oh yeah, I have it on a slide. Metabolism, cardiac function, mitochondrial function, fat storage and metabolism are really key ones that we're looking for next um, and that have been implicated in mammals. So this, um, is the first study, to my knowledge, to study the gene expression of torpor in birds. It's been done in mammals a bunch, but um, there's very little that we know about heterothermy in birds in general. Of the 10,000 plus bird species, torpor has been studied in less than 1%. Uh, and I'm really excited in, in the next, I don't know, maybe 10 years to look at um, uh, other natural systems, uh, evolutionary systems like sunbirds and hummingbirds. Sunbirds are in Africa and in Asia and hummingbirds are only in North and South America. They're both nectar feeding species that also eat insects. Um, evolutionarily, they're very, very divergent, but ecologically, they're very convergent. They have very similar uh, niches. Um, and then in contrast, there's hummingbirds and night jars, which are really evolutionarily close to each other, look completely different, have completely different ecologies, but both can use deep topper. Uh, so I think by studying the genetic mechanisms that underlie topper and these diverse species, we can find out more about all kinds of things, um, like the evolution of heterothermy, the evolution of endothermy. One of the hypotheses uh, that currently exists is that endotherms evolved via heterotherms. And so there was an intermediate state where animals had to be had to do both in order to get to the endothermy, endothermy bit that we enjoy today. Um, and so we, I'm interested in looking across birds and mammals to see whether they share uh, pathways of using heterothermy. So there's a lot of interesting applications to this work in mammal uh, models, like in the ground squirrels. People have found that these tau proteins accumulate in the brain uh, they, that also accumulate in Alzheimer's patients, but these ground squirrels are able to clear them out of the brain when they come out of hibernation. Um, they also slow down their hearts, but when they warm back up, they don't have arrhythmia or tachycardia or bradycardia or any of the things that you'd expect when you cool the heart down. Uh, they also slow down their immune function and they keep, up, keep track of time. Like mammals that hibernate for eight months in a year underground in a burrow, somehow know when it's spring and when they have to come out and mate. Um, so time seems to be a really important thing for them to keep the function of. 
Another really interesting application is that is in the use of therapeutic hypothermia, where people are trying to uh, safely cool and rewarm humans, like in stroke and cardiac patients, to minimize damage while they do their surgeries. And then one of my favorites to think about is um, with human hibernation and space flight, like NASA started conducting symposia to think about how this can be made a reality. And I think with all of the, the private space organizations, it's possible to start thinking about this in a little bit more of a funded way. Um, I am really invested in science outreach and communication. I've given over 90 talks and um, I, I love mentoring and I've mentored a lot of students. I think it's really important to me and uh, essential to my sense of purpose to talk about my work to the broader public. Um, and I love writing grants. So these are some of the grants that I've gotten um, as a PI on the left and as a collaborator on the right. Um, none of this work would have been possible without all of the incredible students that I've had the uh, good fortune to work with, uh, including the last four who are current Cornell first year like freshman students um, who are with me in the field right now. And my collaborators who are incredibly generous people um, I would not be a scientist if it weren't for them and uh, all of my field stations who've been so welcoming to me. And I would love your question. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we have time for one or two really quick questions. Um, so. While we're waiting for questions from the chat, I have one, um, which is when you're thinking about um, genes that are downregulated or upregulated between um, torpor versus um, uh, the normal awake state, um, what's your standard? Like, does the total amount of gene expression go down in torpor, or do the, does the identity just change? Yeah, I think it's a tricky question because we have to normalize, but um... People have looked at how many genes are upregulated versus downregulated in topper versus normothermy, and it's and it seems like in mammals they found that more genes were upregulated than down significantly upregulated than significantly downregulated when they were in topper. Oh wow! I think we are seeing the opposite in the birds, um, and then the identity definitely changes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, last call for next questions, and I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the next talk. Thank you so much, Anusha. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, Teresa, I guess I'll introduce the next speaker. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you so much, Anusha. That was amazing. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Joaquina Delas, who is a postdoc at the Francis Crick Institute, um, who's really dedicated to understanding how the non-coding genome regulates cell fate decisions um, during development. So in her PhD at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, she studied how long non-coding RNAs impact cell fate decisions during blood development. And more recently in her postdoc, she's been working to understand how cis regulatory elements um, within the non-coding genome interpret signaling cues and direct cell fake choice. And this is the, the story that she's gonna be telling us more about today. Thank you, Sishi. Um, all right, so um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present my work. I'm very excited to be sharing it with you today. Um, so during, yeah, during development, signaling cues direct cell fate decisions. And this specialization from multipotency um, to differentiate cells here in different colors requires expressing and repressing specific gene programs. But the gene, the coding genes are a very small proportion of the genome and all the instructions for when these genes should be turned on and off are contained within the non-coding genome in these colored areas. So I'm really interested in understanding how the non-coding genome regulates cell fate decisions and uh, how this um, is regulated in the development uh, where allocation of sulfate is really important and any mutations or misregulation would lead to um, developmental disorders, for example. Um, so this interest started during my PhD um, where I joined Greg Hannon at Cold Spring Harbor Labs to study how London coding RNAs regulated um, differentiation using blood development and uh, blood differentiation as a model. And at the time, these uh, enigmatic molecules were of high interest and uh, up because of their many proposed different roles. And one of them, which was that they could potentially regulate gene expression at the chromatin level. 
uh, we really wanted to, to do a systematic and rigorous approach to identify functional link. Right? So this involved developing um, computational and molecular tools that I needed for this project, as well as establishing um, all the essays for uh, in vitro and in vivo perturbations. Uh, but through this work, I um, actually um, managed to uh, get robust phenotypes for uh, different link RNAs, both in leukemia and stem cell differentiation. Uh, but at the end of this project, the conclusion was that actually uh, London coin RNAs could play very diverse roles and not necessarily gene regulation. So to hone in uh, on my interest on how um, gene regulation can be controlled during development um, through the non-coding genome, I joined James Briscoe's lab um, to use uh, his model system to tackle my questions. Uh, so what I find very interesting is that we know uh, these pieces of regulatory DNA drive gene expression, um, so for example, enhancers, but beyond acting as transcription factor um, binding platforms, um, how they act, which complexes they require, they recruit and in which order and how they exert their function, is our knowledge on this is, is actually very limited. And moreover, most of our knowledge is on activating transcription factors, whereas a large proportion um, of transcription factors are repressing. So how they exert the activity and how the elements uh, to which they bind uh, potentially exert silencing activity is really understudied. So I'm really interested in gaining better knowledge on this. So today I'm gonna tell you a story where we've used um, the neural tube as a model system to understand regulatory strategies. So um, spinal cord development uh, starts with this um, neural tube patterning, um, which is fascinating because in response to a single signal here in the ventral side, Sony Hedgehog gets secreted and at different distance, distances from this source, different cell types get specified in these stripes that I've colored, which are called domains. Um, so these are different neural progenitors that would generate very different types of neurons when they differentiate. So for example, PMN are progenitor motor neurons, which will generate motor neurons that are necessary for innervating muscles. Um, whereas right next to them, uh, P3s get specified, which will later generate V3 interneurons, which are required for locomotor coordination. So apart from functionally distinct, we can molecularly define them by a combination, uh, um, a combination of, of markers, a combinatorial code of markers. And all of these markers are transcription factors that are repressors. And so they act through a cross repressive uh, network. So this seemed like the perfect system to study how a continuous signal gets interpreted by the regulatory genome through um, a network of repressors. When thinking about the different strategies that the regulatory genome could be employing to decode a continuous signal into discrete cell states, we could come up with uh, two potential strategies. So. On the one hand, we thought um, that different cell types here again in colors could rely on a differential element availability strategy. So for example, each cell type would have access to specific types of uh, specific elements. So um, for example, like cell type specific enhancers and these enhancers would drive gene specific activity in the different cell types and the availability of these elements would be the main determinant for the regulatory program and the gene expression. But alternatively, because um, all the cell types rely on the same pathway uh, transduced by the same effectors, we thought that it was possible as well that all the cell types would have access to the same elements, that, that then it would be about which transcription factors are binding to the same elements, but in different cell types that would later um, the, decide the, the gene expression outcomes. So to get at these questions, uh, I have used a cellular model of uh, ventral spinal cord ventral patterning, uh, which uses a um, mouse embryonic stem cells, and then I give them equivalent signals to what the cells would see in vivo to drive this pattern in. And then uh, I mimic, I am the, the gradient, I mimic the gradient with different concentrations of Sony Hedgehog using an agonist called SAG. So I just have a couple of slides on uh, this model because it's really robust and I've been very excited to, very fortunate to be able to use it. Um, so at low concentrations or zero nanomolar of this, of this agonist, we get expression of for example, uh, PAC6, which is a marker that is expressed farther away from the source. Whereas at the highest concentration that I'm using, 500 nano nanomolar, you get expression of uh, NKX 2.2, which you can see in the diagram, is expressed closest to the source. Uh, so this is a very nice dose response. But, but what you can also see is that um, in this other image at the 100, you can see a mixture of two different colors, which are two different markers for alternative cell fates. 
And so, as I said earlier, it's sulfate is, um, you can molecularly distinguish it by a combinatorial code. So what I've done is I've um, established a multi-parametric flow cytometry assay, taking advantage of my uh, flow expertise from hematopoiesis, where we use flow a lot, uh, to get a, a readout of the quantitative readout of the proportions of cell types at different concentrations. So we can nicely see a dose response effect where the highest proportion of the most ventral cells get generated at the highest concentration of the gradient. So this is very nice. However, what we could see is that at any given concentration, there's always a mixture of cell types. Now to get at how the regulatory genome is, in, is, um, is interpreting the signal, we need to really get um, cell type specific information. And we decided that ATAC-seq would give us the broadest information in terms of what the global accessible genome was open, was closed, what are the regulatory elements. But ATAC-seq is usually performed in life cells, uh, whereas here my only way to distinguish cell types was, with, was through transcription factors. So what I had to do was develop um, a strategy that we've called CATS attack, where I can perform ATAC-seq on fixed spinobalized cells, and then I can sort them to uh, separate pure populations based on intracellular transcription factors. And this can be very useful um, for any system or a differentiation paradigm where we don't have uh, readily available live reporters. So using this technique, I have profiled the cells across the differentiation time course and isolated all the different cell types that get generated at the different concentrations to ask what is happening with the regulatory genome. Um, so this slide, what I'm showing you is a principal component analysis of all the regulatory genome changes, all the accessible chromatin that is changing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it was the first key surprising result that really told us that this was quite interesting. So each uh, symbol is a sample. And in the first plot, I've colored them by the, the day of differentiation. And you can nicely see how there's a transition from lighter colors to darker colors as they progress through the days. And this makes sense because at the beginning, they haven't seen the signals and they see the signals and they become the cell types that's supposed to be. So that's all logical. But then what we saw immediately was there was a, a group of cells that was very different from the rest of them. And this was not based on the concentration we were using, but it was actually, um, depending on the cell type. So there were two very different uh, responses. Uh, three cell types in blue, yellow, and orange are very similar. Whereas the green cells, no matter which concentration they come from, is these P3 cell types that I've isolated are very different from everything else. Um, so to look at this at a different way, what this data tell us, um, if we analyze it in many different ways, is that these P3 cell types have access to specific elements that are not accessible anywhere else. Uh, but the P01, P2, and PMN um, have access to a shared chromatin landscape to the same regulatory element, the same accessible chromatin, which is even more fascinating. Uh, because these cell types are molecularly distinct, they will express different markers, different genes, including the marker genes that I've used to isolate them. They will generate different neurons. Um, but actually, but yet they share the same uh, regulatory program, the same elements. So um, with different um, orthogonal analysis and more data, uh, what we think we are seeing is that these three cell types are, have the same accessible genome, and it is a differential binding of transcription factors um, in the same elements, but in different cell types that determine the cellular output through this network of cross repressors. Um, and then this last cell type, in green, the most ventral one employs a differential element of availability, so it has access to a different set of elements. Um, to understand what was driving this, we performed computational footprinting with ataxic data, which pointed us to Fox motifs, and out of all the motifs, the transcription factor that seemed most likely was Fox A2. So we've performed a series of experiments to um, address this. And we've been able to show that in vivo P3, so this most ventral cell type, has a history of FOXA2 expression. So early on, FOXA2 is expressed in cells that later on become P3. We've done this through uh, linear stress in vivo. Uh, using the cellular model, I've knocked out FOXA2 and showed that it's required to make this P3 cell type. And what we think is happening is that FOXA2 is opening up elements that are specifically requiring this P3 cell type and they're later used by other transcription factors. And we've done this by combination of you know, function experiments and more accessibility. And this is um, the 
functional definition of what a pioneer factor does. It opens elements that are closed, uh, and then these elements can be bound by other transcription factors. So we've shown this in neuronal differentiation, but this is a role that HOXA2 has been, uh, does in endoderm and is well studied, for example, towards pancreatic differentiation. So we've also compared these two tissues to try to understand if there's any relationship, and we have uh, proposed uh, some interesting evolutionary implications that I won't talk about today, but I encourage you to um, read the paper, which is now on BioArchive. So through this work, um, what, I've, what we've, been sh we've been shown is that there are two distinct cis regulatory strategies in cell fate acquisition in response to the same signal. So on the left-hand side, the cell types share the same chromatin accessibility, and they employ a differential binding strategy where which transcription factors are binding to the same elements um, determines which genes get turned on and which cell fit the cells acquire. Whereas on the right hand side, uh, this cell type employs a differential element availability strategy where it really needs to open different elements. Um, and this is driven in this case by pioneer factor Fox A2. Uh, but the differential binding is quite interesting to me because um, it suggests that transitions between the cell types could be more plastic if there is no chromatin remodeling required to change between them and just to change in concentration. Um, it's also quite interesting in the context of how we associate open chromatin with gene expression, where actually here we have open chromatin across multiple cell types uh, and it's not associated with necessarily with gene expression. And so there's some interesting implications here. So as I was saying, this means, and we have examples of this, the same element will be open on two cell types that only drives expression of one of them. And what I think this is doing means is that in cell type A here, it will be acting as an enhancer, but in cell type B, where we have um, evidence that is bound by repressors, it will be acting as a silencer. And silencers have been uh, very hard to study, whereas here with the system where we generate alternative cell fits at the same time, I think we have a perfect opportunity to tackle this with a combination of approaches. So what I would like to do is um, use these um, elements uh, as a model to try to understand the, the logical rules that drive these different functions, um, use them to understand uh, what are the molecular mechanisms, whether they are locally or distally, and what um, complexes and cofactors are required for the action. And then I would like to explore this idea of um, potential uh, plasticity by connecting transcription factor dynamics and function switch that eventually leads to this self fit acquisition. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll just to acknowledge my uh, current mentor, Jean Frisco, and everyone involved in this project. And I would um, be happy to answer um, any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joaquina, that was amazing. Um, I'll start with a question while we wait for other questions to come in. Um, I'm just curious, why, why do you think it is that those P3 cells, the green cells, um, have a different uh, strategy than the other cell types? Yeah, so I don't know why they have it, but I can see um, several reasons why it's uh, useful and therefore maybe it's been employed. So. These P3 cells are the closest to the source. And so you need uh, to really restrict where the FOXA2 domain is. Otherwise, you could end up with an enlarged um, floor plate, which is the secondary signaling center. So I think it could be about like this dual origin of uh, this common origin of floor plate and P3s and how you have to restrict that secondary signaling center. Um, but it, yeah, sometimes there's no why, it's just if it happened and it was useful also yeah. to generate cellular diversity, then it was kept. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Very cool, thank you. Um, okay, just one question and then we'll move on to the next um, speaker. And this question is from Julie Siegenthaler. Beautiful talk. In the culture model, if you remove the factors, do the cells go back to earlier cell states? Oh, wow, that's very interesting. So there is um, a point of no return from the neural micellar progenitor into neural progenitors. Um, but then um, the answer is, I don't know, but we are exploring this. So my differentiation paradigm is, is just until specification, so very early on. Uh, but in a follow-up project, we've been looking at how these domains uh, change over time and the different cascades of transcription factors and the strategies there. So we're also interested in, in addressing exactly this question. Can we, can we make them go back? 
So I don't think removing the factors would be enough, but you could potentially alter the transcription factor relationships. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, I'll turn it over to Teresa to introduce the next speaker. Okay, great. As usual, I will wait a second until Sarah is able to share her screen. Okay, so uh, next, I'm very excited to hear from Sarah Bowling, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, during her PhD at Imperial College London, uh, Dr. Bowling studied the role of cell competition in early mouse development. Now, she has developed this really fantastic mouse line in which the lineage of each cell can be traced with high resolution and accuracy. She has and will continue to use this line and future iterations of it to address really fundamental questions in developmental biology. Uh, today, she will tell us about, uh, among other things, the formation and plasticity of cell lineages in early mammalian embryo development. Uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Teresa. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to tell you today about my um, previous research and also going forward into my um, future plans. So I'm driven by this very basic question in developmental biology, which is how does one cell generate an entire organism? So I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of how remarkable this is, but what I think is even more impressive is that the embryo is able to withstand huge amounts of perturbation during development. Uh, for example, you can add cells, you can take cells away, you can add mutant cells, and you could add wild type cells to mutant embryos. And in all cases, at least in the mouse, normal development proceeds and a viable um, offspring are generated. So I'm really interested in understanding, firstly, how lineage formation occurs during normal embryo development, and secondly, in really resolving these mechanisms that underlie embryo resilience in the face of these enormous perturbations. So I became interested in these concepts during my um, graduate work where I studied an embryo quality control mechanism called cell competition. During cell competition, less fit cells are removed from tissues and surrounding cells undergo pro proliferation to compensate for the loss of those cells. And importantly, these less fit cells are completely viable in, um, when they're on their own. Um, so this uh, process is purely context dependent and cell non-autonomous. And what I found during my graduate work was that a mechanism involving P53 and mTOR act to remove these less fit cells during normal embryogenesis. And they actually remove up to a third of cells during gastrulation in the mouse. And here is an example on the right where we can see tetraploid cells that are in green. And these are normally um, eliminated from tissues when surrounding by um, normal diploid cells. And you can see they turn on um, these apoptosis markers such as cleave caspase three. When we hyperactivate the mTOR pathway, we prevent these cells from being eliminated um, and undergoing apoptosis. So I loved studying cell competition and I was really keen to carry on studying um, the process during my postdoctoral work. But something I found really frustrating during my um, graduate work was that we didn't have any tools that allowed us to trace cells in vivo um, in the natural state. Um, which would allow us to um, really tackle um, a lot of the physiological um, components of cell competition. So I decided to carry out my postdoc in the lab of Fernando Camargo, who are um, experts in developing DNA barcoding tools for high resolution lineage tracing. And my task at the beginning of my project was to work on developing a mouse model that would allow us to simultaneously trace the origin of single cells and preferably a large number of single cells alongside the transcriptome of single cells. So to do this, we generated a mouse called Carlin and Carlin stands for CRISPR activated repair lineage tracing. Carlin mice contain barcodes in their DNA that are composed of 10 different guide RNA target sites. And in the presence of Cas9 and guide RNAs that target those sites, a double strand breaks form in this array, and these get repaired in an error prone fashion to result in a range of deletions and insertions. And this combination of indels acts as a unique inheritable marker of the cell and its progeny. So we showed that we can generate fully inducible barcoding using Carlin, and that these barcodes can be detected at the DNA and the RNA level. 
and we read them out using next generation sequencing. So here on the right, I'm showing some of the data we get from this. Um, each row represents a unique barcode. Um, we see um, insertions and deletions right the way across the length of the array. So one of the first um, questions we tackled with Carlin was understanding how the blood system recovers from chemotherapy treatment. So to understand this, we barcoded mice using doxycycline. Uh, we then treated mice with the chemotherapy reagent 5-fluorouracil uh, or 5-FU. And 5-fluorouracil causes um, ablation of a significant proportion of the blood cells in the mouse. 10 days later, we took um, a range of progenitor cells from the bone marrow of these mice just as they're recovering from chemotherapy and we performed 10x um, encapsulation and single cell sequencing. And we were able to annotate our cell types um, by using the whole transcriptome information into um, either hematopoietic stem cells or multipotent progenitor cells or myeloid megakaryocyte and erythroid cells. And on top of this, we were able to um, uh, put on our Carlin information. So here I'm showing Carlin barcodes that have been grouped into those barcodes that only show up in our stem cell compartment. These are blue. Um, so that indicates they're not um, actively differentiating um, since we labeled. And those barcodes that um, show up in both our stem cell and our non-stem cell compartments. So these cells have actively differentiated um, since we labeled um, the mice. So in our control mice, where we didn't give them five of you, um, most of our barcodes that show up in the HSCs are largely confined to the HSCs, indicating that in those three weeks, there's not too much differentiation of these cells. However, following 5-FU treatment, we can see that there's this expansion of the HSCs, and there's uh, um, many more of these green HSC-derived clones that are linking HSCs with non-HSCs, indicating active differentiation. And one of the things we were really surprised to see was that rather than all HSCs being responsible for the recovery of the blood system, we found that only a handful of very highly active HSC clones were responsible for replenishing um, the blood system. And um, it suggests that there was this clonal bottleneck um, involved in regeneration of the blood following chemotherapy treatment. And we had our transcriptional signatures associated um, with this, uh, with each cell type. So we were able to define molecular drivers orchestrating this HSC recovery. And this showed a handful of genes that were enriched in our parent um, hematopoietic stem cells, so the ones that were responsible for regenerating the blood system, and those that were enriched in our child childless HSCs that were made largely quiescent. And this showed a few genes that we knew to be associated with um, cell proliferation and um, differentiation already, but also a number of genes that hadn't previously been defined with these roles. So this could be really important to follow up on to understand how the blood system um, regenerates um, following different injuries. So more recently, I've been turning back to developmental biology and using Carlin to understand lineage formation in the embryo. And one of my ongoing projects is focused on understanding blood formation in the embryo. So during blood formation, we know that there are many, many different progenitor cells in the embryo that have different roles and different functions, but we still don't know their precise identities or their precise lineage outputs. So to understand this, we barcoded embryos early in development. We took blood cells from a range of different organs um, late in gestation, and we performed single cell RNA sequencing. So we were able to precisely annotate our cell types, and then using our Carlin information, we were able to cluster them into um, groups of cells that were linked at the clonal level. So here I'm showing as different colors, I'm showing different um, groups of progenitor cells with similar outputs. And I don't have to, time to go through the data and our findings, so I'll just summarize our broad findings here. Um, we found that there was a really early segregation of multiple waves of blood in the embryo that was much earlier than we were expecting. We were able to define the outputs of distinct progenitor cell subsets in the embryo. Um, we found that most of the lymphoid cells in the embryo were not actually derived from traditional progenitor cells. Um, such as um, hematopoietic stem cells, but from a distinct um, early specified um, wave of um, multipotent cells. 
And we found that these non um, stem cell derived populations are able to survive long term into adulthood. And we supported our barcoding data with um, traditional CRE models as well. In my second ongoing project, I've been working on resolving lineage branching points of early gastrulation. Um, so for this, we barcoded embryos early in development, and we took embryos a couple of days, days later and performed single cell RNA sequencing. And um, this is showing again the whole transcriptome information uh, where we see many different cell types. And our Carlin clustering allows us to resolve the early um, groupings of progenitor cells, um, giving rise to these different cell types. Um, just to summarize, this um, analysis revealed early branching points of gastrulation. These data sets act as a ground truth for our um, for lineage inference models that are becoming increasingly common to study early development. And um, we have also found that there's multiple lineage sources for endothelial cells that are associated with distinct transcriptional programs. So we're actively following up on this now, um, as this has been a really exciting finding. So just to summarize my postdoctoral work, um, Carl and mice have enabled us to define mechanisms involved in driving the recovery of the blood system following injury. We've been able to use Carlin to map the embryonic origins of the blood system. And we've also resolved the lineage branching points in early gastrulation. So going forward, I want to use the questions and concepts and tools from both my graduate work and my postdoctoral work to understand this broader question of how embryos develop in normal and perturbed conditions. So specifically, I want to explore how and when cells commit to their fate. I want to understand to what extent differentiation decisions are flexible. I want to understand how cells are able to compensate for missing cells during development. And I want to understand why this regenerative capacity is lost in adulthood. And specifically, I want to use two different systems that are complementary to tackle these questions. So first, I want to use the neural crest, um, which is a population of cells um, dubbed the fourth germ layer that has this extraordinary lineage potential, giving rise to a huge array of diverse cell types. And the in vivo potency of the neural crest is really poorly understood. And there's also a high plasticity of cellular states in the neural crest, and there's a poor understanding of the mechanisms underlying um, this plasticity. So I want to use a variety of tools, including barcoding, to really pinpoint um, the uh, lineage decisions and the mechanisms underlying plasticity in neural crest development. And alongside this, I want to use human gastroloids as a model to understand human development. And this is because the early branching points of gastrulation and hu human development are pretty much unknown. Um, human gastroloids represent a tractable and scalable model for investigating this. And it's also amenable to targeted cell ablations, genetic and teratogenic analysis. Um, so I think the system will give me and my lab a really useful and um, tractable system to investigate this broader question. And specifically using these platforms, I want to elucidate lineage trees in these systems. I want to evaluate cell compensation and really um, define and um, manipulate the mechanisms un um, underlying embryo resilience. And finally, I want to manipulate these regenerative mechanisms. And in the long term, I want to um, be able to take this into adult systems to understand how, um, how uh, uh, adult cells lose this ability and how we might be able to um, bring it back to, um, to um, translate into regenerative um, purposes. So I want to thank everyone involved in the work, particularly my mentors, Fernando Camargo and Bertie Gotkins. I've had really wonderful collaborators over the last few years, and they are highlighted in bold. I want to thank my um, funders, The Leading Edge, and thanks to everyone for listening. So while we uh, wait for some questions to come in on the chat, I have one to get us started off. Um, so you mentioned uh, briefly that uh, your lineage barcode information can act as a sort of ground truth for um, lineage inference models. And um, I was wondering uh, how much you had done, like how, how well are the models performing? 
uh, when you compare them to the sort of ground truth that you know? Yes, yeah, so, so far we've just been com um, comparing to Waddington OT methods. So um, for those who aren't aware, they um, use very close time points of single cell RNA sequencing data stitched together to try and kind of infer lineage information. And um, we found that although broadly um, Waddington OT does recapitulate a lot of the um, kind of broad lineage decisions, there's a lot of detail lost. And I think in particular, it's um, when uh, a cell type is made from several different diverse progenitor cells, it just can't really resolve that, um, that level of detail. And um, one of the places that that was really, um, really obvious was in endothelial cells, where we can see clearly in the embryo, multiple different cell types make this, um, this common transcriptional state. Um, whereas the Waddington OT models predicted that they all came from the same place, just kind of out of nowhere. So um, yeah, we're following up on that. It, it was um, clear in other situations as well, particularly in the mesoderm where there's a huge variety of mesodermal cells made. Um, the Waddington OT wasn't so good at predicting that. That's fantastic. Underscores the importance. Awesome. Um, so I think if we don't have any other questions, um, we'll move on to the next talk and try to stay on time. Thank you so much for that amazing talk, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. That was that was lovely. Um, okay, I'm going to start introducing our next speaker as she sets up. So our next speaker is Krista Angelieri, who is a postdoc at Cornell University um, at the intersection of tissue regeneration and transposon biology. Um, she earned a PhD from UT Austin, where she focused on how DNA methylation uh, contributes to retinal stem cell uh, maintenance in zebrafish. And more recently in her postdoc, she has been um, working on this fascinating new research angle involving the impact of transposon activity in tissue repair and regeneration. And, and with that, um, I'll hand the mic over to Krista. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Yes, um, thank you, Cece, and um, to everyone at the Leading Edge program uh, for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, I'm really excited to walk everyone through this uh, newly budding project uh, focused on the intersection of transposable elements and regeneration and looking forward to any feedback that anyone has. All right, so um, my research career actually began as a military intelligence officer in the US Air Force, uh, where I studied uh, weapon systems and worked with fighter pilots. Um, but then after I transitioned into uh, civilian life, I realized that um, I really wanted to contribute uh, back to this um, population, uh, primarily through um, advancing regenerative therapies for wounded veterans. Um, and so I got this started or started this um, path through graduate school um, at UT Austin with uh, Dr. Jeff Gross, where we focused on um, eye regeneration and um, development. And uh, like Cece mentioned, my uh, graduate project was focused on uh, DNA methylation and how that's required to maintain the retinal stem cell uh, population in the zebrafish eye. Um, and just a really brief overview, um, uh, DNA methylation is an epigenetic mark and uh, it regulates a whole plethora of processes um, it, along your chromatin. And what I found from uh, this work was that it was required for uh, maintaining the methylation pattern in retinal stem cells in order to maintain the proper proliferative uh, fate, as well as the gene expression patterns of uh, that di defined the retinal stem cells of the eye. And loss or hypomethylation uh, resulted in death of these cells and transposon deregulation. And this is where my project really got interesting, uh, for me at least. Um, I got really fascinated with these transposons. And it actually inspired me to create this novel transposon reporter line, um, which uh, actually will uh, cause the cell to glow green with GFP when there is an active transposition event in that cell. And so uh, this is just one example of uh, my favorite example of uh, one of these fish where you had a uh, neuron running from the base of the brain all the way down the length of the fish uh, to the tail. 
And while I was getting uh, going through this project, I uh, came across some really interesting literature that uh, across a couple different organisms that uh, describe transposon upregulation in regenerating tissues. Uh, for example, here, the axolotl after limb amputation, um, it showed that, or the uh, authors showed that line one, a specific transposon family was upregulated in the limb blastema, and this was uh, subsequently downregulated as regeneration proceeded. And so I started to wonder, is it possible that transposons are actually contributing to regeneration in some uh, way? So um, I then contacted Dr. Cedric Rashad, a leader in the transposon field, and whose lab specializes in bioinformatic analyses of transposon biology, which is a skill that I really wanted to uh, pick up. Um, and so I have since started uh, my trans uh, postdoctoral career with uh, Cedric Pichot in his lab. And so together we've actually formed a really great partnership uh, with me providing some zebrafish expertise and his lab uh, teaching me the ropes of bioinformatics, which is uh, really exciting. So um, with the help of a very talented undergraduate, Nornubari Bacha, uh, we first sought to determine if there was a correlation between an organism's regenerative competence and the number of potentially active transposons present within their genomes. So we started first by ranking a short list of organisms in relative order of regeneration competency with the least competent to the left and the most competent to the right. We then compared their genomic transposon profiles uh, using publicly available repeat master data. And by counting the number of transposon superfamilies with less than 2% um, sequence divergence uh, within each genome, we actually identified an increasing trend in the total number of potentially active transposons in each genome. Uh, these data actually suggest that there may be a potential correlation between regenerative competency and transposon activity. However, uh, this kind of seems counterintuitive since transposons are inherently uh, mutagenic and often lead uh, to disease. Um, so one other aspect um, of uh, the regeneration field is that the mechanisms governing the differences or uh, governing regeneration as a whole are still being determined. And that uh, those differences between species is still unknown. Um, so there are a lot of uh, common processes such as tissue inflammation and proliferation that are common across species, but how that's regulated uh, seems to be missing. And so uh, we're kind of coming in the regeneration field from a slightly different angle and wondering if transposons actually are filling in a, a part of that missing a link between a regeneration across species. So what are TEs or transposable elements? Uh, generally speaking, TEs are mobile genetic elements that are capable of self-replication within a host genome. They're extremely diverse in type and uh, motility in the byproducts that they produce, uh, as you can see here through um, RNA, cDNA, uh, proteins, et cetera. Um, and in their presence within a host genome. For instance, they can be found in tens to millions of copies within a single genome. In humans, 50% uh, of our genome is comprised of transposable elements, and that's actually uh, similar uh, approximately to uh, that seen in zebrafish. But why might they uh, be active during regeneration? So if we consider the regenerative environment, we know that regeneration requires tightly controlled uh, inflammation, and that inflammation drives uh, stem cell activation, which causes these uh, in resident stem cells to undergo extensive chromatin remodeling events, and that will allow for uh, DNA replication and cell proliferation to proceed. However, disruption of any of these events actually results in a stalling of the regenerative process. Um, and it should be noted that this uh, trifecta of cellular processes is actually really conducive to a transposon activity. For instance, uh, inflammation can actually, uh, the inflammation response of transcription factors can bind to and induce transposon uh, expression. Uh, conversely, transposon byproducts can propagate that inflammation. Additionally, transposons are often stably uh, repressed via heterochromatin marks, which can be 
released from that repression state as resident stem cells undergo activation. Uh, moreover, in human uh, embryonic stem cells, uh, some transposons are expressed in and even contribute to embryonic stem cell identity. Uh, these uh, suggest that um, some TEs, uh, that uh, these TEs are actually contributing to those states and so they're uh, inherent or promoting uh, those states. And, and so that could that possibly then uh, be contributing to regeneration in a somatic tissue as well. So as you can imagine, these traits start leading or started, started to lead us uh, to ask several questions, the first of which is whether or not transposon uh, response to injury is a tissue and or cell specific uh, type of response. And so to start getting at this question, um, I began by using uh, publicly available bulk RNA-seq data to uh, begin learning uh, bioinformatics and beginning with the zebrafish as a model, uh, since I uh, am very familiar with that model as well. So the zebrafish eye is actually structurally analogous to the human eye, it contains all of the same retinal cell types and laminated structure. So light actually comes in through the lens and gets focused on the photoreceptors at the back of the eye, which, uh, prop oops, excuse me, which propagates the signal out to the neurons, um, which are highlighted here in yellow. And those actually uh, send a signal out the optic nerve to the brain. Additionally, the retina is encompassed by a retinal pigmented epithelium at the back of the eye, uh, the cell type highlighted here in cyan. And uh, this uh, tissue actually helps to maintain the retinal health um, and is considered non-neural. So I chose these two tissues um, primarily because they're closely related in their developmental fate. Um, however, they are two distinct tissue types. And um, so it kind of allows me for to start teasing apart whether or not there's a cell or tissue specific difference in uh, transposon expression after injury. Additionally, uh, both of these uh, tissues are fully regenerate, uh, fully capable of regenerating after injury. So as I uh, um, began uh, this uh, analysis, I found that in, indeed in the uh, retinal pigmented epithelium or that cyan non-neural tissue, uh, I found some upright uh, dysregulated transposable elements as well as within uh, the neural cell types um, at the inner uh, side of the eye. Uh, this uh, is the first time that this has been reported in uh, zebrafish. Um, so it further reinforces that transposons are a common uh, phenotype across uh, organisms after injury. Uh, moreover, uh, these uh, transposon families don't seem to be uh, the same between these two tissues. So this actually suggests that transposons respond in a tissue or cell type specific fashion. Uh, another uh, piece of information that we can start to glean from this is that all of the differentially uh, regulated transposons uh, that are upregulated actually belong to the long terminal repeat class of transposable elements, which have been suggested to have strong promoters, which promote their self-expression and the they have the potential to retain activity and are known to be the primary target of uh, a PUE uh, pyranide pathway uh, in the gonads, which we can get into uh, later. Additionally, we found that some transposons are downregulated after injury, which indicates that these are normally expressed during tissue homeostasis and uh, warrants some further investigation in the future. Uh, additionally, um, we found that uh, transposon activity can actually be tied to the regeneration process. So you can see in the um, uh, retinal ganglion cells or in the yellow population, these were actually injured early on right after uh, injury, 6, 12, and 24 hours. And so they're likely going to be uh, more tied to the initial uh, inflammatory response and stem, stem cell activation whereas those in the RPE are two to four and seven days. So they're gonna be more uh, uh, situated in the cycling and differenti differentiation phases of uh, uh, tissue regeneration. So if we come back to the cell cycle diagram, we can now consider uh, how these uh, transposons may actually be detrimental to uh, regeneration. So we know um, that uh, some TEs actually uh, work to propagate or transpose during DNA replication. And as you can imagine, that's going to cause a lot of DNA damage and uh, in, impede cell cycle. So 
uh, there has to be some method of transposon repression coming from the host cell to regulate this process uh, during regeneration. So the first uh, place we looked was with the PeeWee pathway. So this is a, a major mechanism of transposon repression in animal gonads, as shown in the uh, in situ hybridization done by Norna Bari. And um, <clears throat> we know that uh, these uh, PeeWee proteins are actually required during regeneration in both axolotl limb and the uh, planarian, such that if you lose PeeWee uh, expression, you impede tissue regeneration. And so, uh, uh, there isn't a whole lot of other, uh, unfortunately, uh, repression uh, information out there during uh, regeneration regarding uh, transposon repression in particular. So uh, part of what I'm working on right now is to actually start assessing uh, this uh, mechanistically using uh, first some genetic mutants. So um, with the first question, uh, as we come back to um, our general hypothesis that transposons are expressed and potentially causing damage during regeneration, we would expect that increased levels of transposon activity would impede regeneration so uh, such that uh, your host must uh, uh, increase potentially a PeeWee activity or a, another uh, compensatory mechanism to downregulate transposons and allow for regeneration to proceed successfully. Uh, interestingly, we also uh, were able to amplify PV like one from the zebrafish eye, which was not reported previously. Um, so this suggests that PV is actually present in the homeostatic uninjured eye and, and could be functioning here. So what we would expect is in a PV mutant background, the loss of PV activity would cause a prolonged or an increased transposon activity and potentially increase uh, damage to the tissue and impair regeneration. Additionally, we can modulate uh, transposon activity uh, using chemical modulation. Um, so how we're doing that is we're actually going to, um, in collaboration with a couple of uh, new undergraduates, uh, we're actually adding some retroviral uh, drugs uh, common to um, uh, HIV therapy um, in humans. And these are actually able to inhibit transposons uh, in the fish as well. So if we inhibit early on uh, during tissue regeneration, we would expect that it's going to affect inflammation and stem cell activation. And then if we inhibit later on during uh, tissue regeneration, uh, we would expect that it's actually going to contribute in some capacity to uh, promoting the uh, cell proliferation phases. And so what we're hoping from some of this work is to actually identify a mechanism of accelerating uh, tissue injury through repression of transposable elements. And then lastly, coming uh, full circle to kind of where I began, um, I'm hoping that um, through all of this work, I can then apply these findings across different model organisms and potentially contribute to some more translational work in the future. Uh, that would promote um, some human regenerative therapies. And then as a quick recap, our general hypothesis here is that in a highly regenerative species like the zebrafish or axolotl, um, upon injury, you would have upregulation of transposon expression, which would also induce uh, some inflammatory responses in those cells. So the host must activate a repression mechanism to then downregulate that transposon expression and activity and limit the amount of transposition uh, occurring in the cell and thus allowing for successful regeneration. However, in a less uh, regenerative competent species, uh, you would have to, or these uh, species would be, uh, would have a reduced uh, efficiency in uh, repressing transposons, which would allow for increased transposition activity and uh, potentially impair regeneration. Uh, so with that, and I'm a little over, I apologize. Um, I would like to thank everybody at Cornell and uh, the Fischer Lab specifically, and my undergraduate uh, researchers and everyone at the Leading Edge program. And I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Krista. That's such a fascinating, this is such a fascinating angle on regeneration and one I'd certainly never heard before. Um, while we wait for uh, questions. Um, I'll start with one. Um, you had shown that 
that animals which were which were higher in regeneration capacity had more transposon families. And that seems counterintuitive with this idea that, you know, the more repression you have, the more T repression you have, the better regeneration. So how are those two connected? Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. So what we're finding from the literature is that um, a lot of, they have a very efficient uh, way of repressing transposons. And so uh, the PeeWee pathway is specifically one of those. So PeeWee is a, a stem cell marker and it's uh, required for uh, maintaining that fate. Um, and it has a, a, a transposon independent function in regeneration in that capacity. So PeeWee itself could be doing kind of a dual transposon as well as um, stem cell uh, function. And what we're thinking is that we just don't have the same capacity of, um, even with our lower number of transposons, regulating the ones that we do have that are activated. And, and so that's kind of where we're at, but there's still very minimal uh, data at the moment um, in the field as to what might be happening, if that makes any sense. So, cool. yeah. so, so, you, so naturally you'll address that. <laughs> That's what, yeah, one of the things we're working on. So we have a lot of, a lot of project ideas. So I'm just trying to focus on the ones that we think will be most promising. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So I will um, hand it over to Teresa to close us out. Thank you very much. And a huge thank you and congratulations to all of the speakers. Those were uh, all really fantastic talks uh, that were a joy to listen to. Um, and I also want to thank everyone who attended. Um, there will be more Leading Edge talks every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout July, noon Eastern, 11 Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, if you miss a session, uh, recordings will be available soon on the YouTube channel of the HHMI Genelia Research Campus. And the next session, which is this Wednesday, is going to be on cancer. So we're really looking forward to that as well. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye.